Hi folks, today we're going to start talking a little bit about the thermodynamics of alpha helices. An alpha helix, as you recall, is a protein element of secondary structure. Uh, this is not particularly well drawn, but it'll serve my point. Uh, and it is a corkscrew kind of feature. Um, and this feature is stabilized by hydrogen bonds down the backbone. And there is a number of hydrogen bonds uh, that hold this whole complex together. And you can imagine the longer the helix gets, the more hydrogen bonds will be holding it together. Uh, an alpha helix is a special type of helix. It's not the only type. Um, some of the features that make an alpha helix an alpha helix are the hydrogen bonding pattern. We get hydrogen bonds uh, from amino acid N to amino acid N plus 4. And that's a key feature. Um, for example, if this was amino acid 29, it would be hydrogen bonding to the one that's four after that, 29 plus four, which is 33. And so every fourth amino acid is going to be hydrogen bond to the one before it uh, by four. So that's gonna be really easy to uh, kind of figure out. That's a key feature of an alpha helix. Another key feature is the pitch of the helix, 5.4 angstroms per turn. That's how far does the helix move through space uh, every time we go around once. Um, there's also 3.6 amino acids per turn. That tells you how many amino acids can comprise a turn. And, for example, you can tell if you had a strong length of amino acids how long this helix would be from that, that uh, particular set of data. An alpha helix also has characteristic phi and psi backbone dihedral angles uh, that set it up. And so that's classic for an alpha helix. Uh, you can also have uh, something called a pi helix. Okay. A pi helix um, is, has a lot of these features as well, uh, but its key backbone, uh, backbone hydrogen bonding is N to N plus 5, which means that every turn of this helix is a little bit fatter than an alpha helix. Again, this, uh, this characteristic phi psi angles, characteristic pitches, and turn numbers make a pi helix a specific type of helix. There's also three n helices, which go n to n plus 3, and 227 ribbons, which go n to n plus 2. And so there's different uh, 310 ribbons or 310 helices would be um, a little bit narrower than an alpha helix. 227 would be narrower still. And so there's a bunch of different types of helices uh, that we could be concerned with. Uh, in this case, we're considering alpha helices. Um, and for all these helices, the thing that we care about is the fa most favorable feature in, uh, that will help an alpha helix form is the hydrogen bonds, is the enthalpy from the H bonds. And for any, uh, any uh, helical uh, H bond, the enthalpy for them is 1.4 kcals per mole in the favorable direction, negative 1.4 kcals per mole. Um, and so our delta H for our H bonds is going to be negative 1.4 kcal per mole, scaled by the number of hydrogen bonds we have. Now, for an alpha helix, we mentioned that there is n to n plus 4 hydrogen bonding, and that means down here at the helical nucleus, if I zoom in on this, we're going to start getting some hydrogen bonds that snake up the backbone here. But on the bottom of the helix, we're going to start having some unsatisfied hydrogen bonds to the backbone on the very bottoms of the, the helical nucleus. Uh, we're only going to start forming them once we make a full loop. And so if we have n to n plus 4 hydrogen bonding, we're going to have n minus 4 H bonds. For a pi helix, since we go n to n plus 5 along the backbone, we're going to have n minus 5 H bonds N, again, being the number of amino acids in the chain, of, or in the helix itself. Uh, we'd have N minus 3 for the 310 helix, and N minus 2 H bonds for a 227 ribbon. And so if we're looking for an alpha helix, uh, our total enthalpy from our, our H bonds would be N minus 4 hydrogen bonds. And so our total here would be 1.4 times N minus 4. So if we had a 32 amino acid um, helix, our delta H for H bonds is going to be negative 1.4 times 32 minus 4. Oops, I got 9. Minus 4.
32 minus 4, 28 hydrogen bonds times negative 1.4 is going to equal negative 39.2 kcals per mole. So that's going to be the strength of the glue that holds this 32 amino acid alpha helix together. Now, the helix is going to stay together as long as the glue is strong enough, as long as it's favorable enough to hold together with all of these backbone uh, hydrogen bonds. The only thing that's going to be disfavorable about this helix is having to lock in every single one of those amino acids into a helical conformation. So we have to talk about configurational entropy. Configurational entropy is the cost of locking in an alpha helical or any amino acid into a particular conformation. Uh, this depends on the number of um, uh, configurations. So we can solve this by we're saying that we're going to lock it into one out of a number of ways to organize. For a a backbone angle like phi and psi, this would be number of rotomers. Uh, number of rotomers is how many rotational conformations does each amino acid have. So if we have a number of rotomers, um, that will tell us we have more rotomers, it's going to be harder to lock us in, and if we have fewer rotomers, it's going to be easier to lock us in because we don't have a lot of choices. If we lock it into one out of four, it's going to be easier than locking into one out of 400. Uh, just because there's so much more freedom. For a, uh, for a glycine, which is our most uh, rotationally dispersed amino acid, there are 16 conformations. And so delta S for a glycine would be R, which is uh, 1.987, times 10 to the negative 3 kcal per mole. Um, times the natural log of 1 over 16. Okay. So our delta S for glycine, 1.987 times 10 to the negative third times the natural log of 1 16th, is going to be in kcals per mole, negative 0 0.00551 uh, kcals per mole. That is not a huge amount of uh, cost for locking in a single amino acid, but we'll recall that delta S is always scaled by temperature. And so that means that this number can easily become pretty large. If we did T delta S for glycine at 310, this would be 310 times negative 0 0.00551. And we would end up with a penalty for locking a glycine of negative 1.707 kcals per mole. That is more penalty for locking in a glycine than we're getting out of our hydrogen bonds, if you recall. Each one is giving us 1.4. Each glycine is going to cost us 1.7. So glycines don't like to be in helices, and they give us what's called a helical penalty whenever they are introduced. So that's an interesting idea. Um, for a, uh, a proline, for example, we would have six conformations. Proline is our least flexible because of the uh, five-membered ring in the backbone. Uh, delta S for proline is going to be R log of 1 sixth, so 1.987 times 10 to the negative third, natural log of 1 out of 6. These are estimated. There's no, no one's ever actually looked at them in this particular way, but it's an estimated number. Uh, and the cost of locking into proline is negative uh, 0.00356 kcals per mole. So that's pretty, that's a lot easier to lock in a proline versus a glycine. Everything else that's not glycine and not proline has the same number of backbone dihedral angles, which is approximately eight conformations. So delta S for everything else, for non-gly, non-pro, is going to be 1.987 times the consent of the negative third, 
natural log of 1 8th, which is going to equal negative 0 0.00413 kcals per mole. So the, the composition of our polypeptide really does matter in determining how, how, how wiggly or how stable is our helix. What's the penalty for every single one of these? Um, again, this number is scaled by temperature. All of these would be scaled by temperature. But these are some important basic numbers to know. Uh, it's going to be 5.5 cals per mole or 0 0.00551 kcals per mole for glycine, 3.56 cals per mole for proline, and 4.13 cals per mole for a non-glycine, non-proline. And these, again, are just are converted into kcals per mole. So this is the cost of locking it in, and that's going to be offset by the benefit we get out of every alpha helix uh, hydrogen bond. So, so what we can do is we can summarize delta G for a helix. It's going to be delta H for the H bonds minus T times delta S config. This is the configurational entropy cost uh, of locking in all the amino acids, and this is the uh, benefit we get from the hydrogen bonds holding the whole thing together. Now, again, we can expand this, and so if I wanted to ask a question about an alpha helix, I would set this up as negative 1.4 kcals per mole, which is the strength of every hydrogen bond, times, remember, n minus 4, because that's the size of the nucleus, that it's going to have four unsatisfied hydrogen. And if we wanted to make this polyalanine, uh, we would do T. Uh, and then our delta S is going to be 0 0.00413 kcals per mole. But there's one thing that we also have to take into account. And that is the fact that on any alpha helix, these amino acids here have to lock. But the ones at the end don't have to be locked because they aren't technically part of the helix anymore. And so on each end, we have one half of a set of dihedral angles that is unlocked. We might have a phi down on this end and an unlocked psi at this end uh, for the backbone because we can enter or leave a helix at any angle, but once we're committed, we have to lock in for all of them. And so there's always going to be N minus one angle sets locked. We have a total of a phi and a psi that are unlocked. And so if we're talking sets of angles, which we are for our delta S's, we're always going to have n minus 1 here uh, in our helical equation. So that's how to set it up for an alpha helix. Every helix is going to have this n minus 1 because every helix is going to have 2. This number can change based on the type of helix. This number can change based on the types of amino acids, but everything else is going to stay the same. As long as delta G comes out negative, this helix will be stable. So here's a good example of a question that we might be asked about if we were trying to solve questions about a helix. This is saying, will a 29 residue polyalanine alpha helix be stable at a temperature of 312 Kelvin? Well, we're going to start with our delta G for a helix. And again, that's going to be delta H, H bonds minus T delta S config. And in this case, we're going to use it for alanine because we're all, it's a polyalanine, which means it's all made of alanines. And let's expand this for our system. We have N minus four hydrogen bonds because it's an alpha helix. If it was a pi helix, that would be N minus five, remember. Uh, and each hydrogen bond is always going to be 1.4 kcals per mole. That never changes for a helix. Um, our temperature we know is going to be this, uh, and our entropic cost is going to be n minus 1 because of the two ends of the alpha helix. We have half an angle at one end and half an angle at the other that are unlocked and not having to pay a cost, times the entropic cost of locking in alanine, which is 0 0.00413 kcals per mole. Kelvin. Okay, so as long as delta G comes out negative, this will be a stable alpha helix. It'll be spontaneous to form a helix. If it is positive, it will not be a stable helix. It'll be a coil. Okay, so we can start plugging in. 29 minus 4 times negative 1.4 minus 312 times 29 minus 1 times negative 0.00413. 
we have 25 times 1.4. That is going to give us a grand total of 35 kcals per mole favorable. Remember, negative is favorable for delta G. Um, the glue is 35 kcals per mole favorable. As long as the entropic cost to locking in all this stuff is not greater than 35, um, then we will come out okay, and this will be a stable helix. So we're going to do minus 312 times 28 times negative 0 0.00413. Our entropic cost to locking in these alanines is going to be negative 36.08 kcals per mole. If we combine these two, negative 35 plus 36.08, we end up with a delta G for a helix of 1.08 kcals per mole. Is that going to be a stable helix? Not stable. How do I know? Because this is a positive number. Positive means not stable. If it was negative, this would be a stable helix. So we can use this exact same math to solve for the minimum length of polyalanine and alpha helix. So I'm going to again draw, give our local equation. I'm going to go ahead and skip to the expanded form here. And recall where all these numbers are coming from. This is the entropic cost to lock in an alanine. This is the strength of a hydrogen bond. This is the hydrogen bonding pattern of the alpha helix. This is our temperature. And this happens because the two ends of the alpha helix have a half angle each, or a half set of angles each, a phi on one end and a psi on the other end that is unlocked. So we can solve for n. If we want to know what the minimum length to form a stable helix is, we want to set delta G at zero. Delta G at zero means that we are going to cross from non-spontaneous into spontaneous as long as we have uh, a sufficient number. And the melting of a helix, just like any melting process, is an equilibrium process. And we recall that delta Gs are zero uh, at equilibrium. And so we can start to do some expanding on this. And minus 1, negative 0 0.00413. I'm going to start foiling this in. Negative 1.4n plus 5.6. I'm going to go ahead and foil here and then bring that back in here. I got negative 1.28856n plus 1.28856. Foiling that negative in here, negative 1.4n plus 5.6 plus 1.28856n minus 1.28856 equals zero. Combining like terms, I'm going to put the n's together and the non-n's together. 0 equals negative 0 0.11144. N plus 4.31144. Uh, subtract the, or add this to both sides. Four point three one four one one four four. Divide through by our point oh, our point. Uh, Oh, 
divide through on both sides. 0 0.11144. Sorry, this new tablet's killing me. And we get an N equal to 38.68 amino acids. Can we have 38.68 amino acids? We're going to cut them up one off at 68% of the way? No. So we have to round up to the nearest. If this was 38.01, you would have to round up to the nearest because, again, this is the place where it crosses into favorability. Anything larger than this number is going to be favorable, so we round up to the next amino acid. So this would take 39 alanines to become spontaneous. Our 29 that we had in the last one would not work. We'd have to add another 10 to get that going. All right, so if we want to do find the melting point for an alpha helix, we can easily do that with the same equation, alpha g for the helix. Okay. Uh, it's going to equal our n minus 4 for our alpha helix times negative 1.4 uh, kcals per mole, which is our hydrogen bond enthalpy, minus Tm, which we will solve for, n minus 1 for the top and the bottom of the helix, each having a half unordered angles, and negative 0 0.00413 kcals per mole. Kelvin for the entropic cost of locking in alanines. Okay, so we can, uh, we're can we going to plug in some of our numbers. We have 40 n's. And so let's start to work this. So 36 hydrogen bonds. You can tell us 36 because 40 minus 4. Um, our delta H for hydrogen bonds is negative 50.4. And minus Tm times 39 times uh -oh, 3. Okay, and that all equals zero. Remember that any of these melting processes is an equilibrium. So we can uh, kind of rearrange this guy. We have zero is equal to 0 0.16107 Tm minus 50.4. 50.4 uh, 50 by adding it to both sides equals 0 0.16107 Tm. Tm then equals... 312.9 Kelvin. Okay, so 40 alanines would melt at 312.9. Uh, that makes sense because remember in our last question we were asked what is the length that we need to solve, have a stable helix at 312? It was 39. So then we had 40 in it that had melts a little higher than 312 uh, Kelvin. So that is how to do math for basic. Uh, helices that are all made out of non-glycine and non-proline. So this question is, what is the melting point of a 40 amino acid alpha helix that contains 39 alanines and a single internal glycine? So just a quick sketch of this thing. We have glycine in the middle of the helix, and we have alanines at the two ends. And drawing a sketch like this can be helpful for these kinds of questions because it's going to make a difference for how we set up the equation. Now, again, we're going to start out with our helix equation. Okay, no other thing different here. I actually am going to want to split this out and do n ala plus n gly minus 4. Having the two classes does make a difference as we'll see here when we get to the entropy. Minus Tm, and now we have an entropic system where we have two different classes of entropic amino acids. Alanines are gonna cost a little bit less than glycines to, to order. 
But since alanines are at the top and the bottom, the n ala is going to get the minus 1. Because, again, half of an alanine on either end is unlocked, and so we don't have to pay that cost. So we're going to have n ala times negative 0 0.00413. And then we're going to add n gli times its entropic cost, which is negative 0 0.005. Five five one. Okay, 0. 0.0551. Okay, so that's going to be our. We have a complex uh, system here. Okay, so n l and n gli is the same thing as forty minus four. So again, we're going to have forty minus four times negative one point four. Thirty six times one point four again. Same as before, it was negative fifty point four. But now our entropic cost is going to be slightly higher because of that glycine. So we have 39 alanines, and we have one glycine. So we have 38 times 0.00413, negative 0.15694. And then we're going to add negative 0.00551, one times that times TM. So we're going to get point one six two four five TM equals zero. Point one six two four five TM equals fifty point four TM. Three ten. Three ten point two five. So just introducing a single internal glycine into this helix introduced a penalty that was visible by a melting point shift from 312.9 Kelvin in the last one where it's all alanines down to 310.25, almost three degrees shifted uh, and less stable. Okay. So one glycine does make a big difference for the penalty. All right. So this question is asking, what's the melting point of an alkyl helix between 39 alanines and one in terminal glycine? So I'm going to do my little sketch again. So we have a glycine at the top, maybe, and we have an alanine at the bottom, and the rest are all alanines. So again, I'm going to set up my equation for the two classes, n ala plus n gli minus 4, because it's an alpha helix, negative 1.4, minus tm. Now, in this case, we have an alanine on one end and a glycine on the other. So that means that our alanine is going to be subtracted by one half. Because only the alanine has half of a set of angles un, unorganized. Okay, so that's also going to be multiplied by its entropic cost. Lock it. And the same thing is going to happen to n gly because glycine is also half locked. So there is our equation. Now, again, we still have 40 minus 4 times negative 1.4. That's easy enough. That is, again, our 36 times 1.4, negative 40.4 favorable. Or 50.4, rather, sorry. That's going to be our favorable uh, glue holding this thing together. Now, this piece, we have... 39 alanines, and we have one glycine. So 38 and a half times negative 0 0.0413. We get 0 0.159005. And then we get 0 0.5 times negative 0 0.0551. Okay. So then this whole thing becomes plus 
0 0.161760 TM equals 0. 0 0.161760 TM equals 50.4 TM is equal to 311.5. Okay, so that's an interesting change here. By putting the glycine on the end of the helix versus in the middle, we get a little bit back. So the positioning makes a difference because now we only have to pay half the penalty. So it's actually a little bit cheaper to put it on the end because only half the angles are locked versus when we had to lock them both in the middle of the helix. Um, you can imagine what's going to happen if we try to put glycine on both ends. We would have to change the alanine since it's all in the middle. We don't subtract it. And if we have glycine on both ends, it gets the full minus one. So that's all the ways we could possibly ask questions about helices. Hope that you've learned something today. See you next time.